Well, good morning, Highlands. It is so good to be together. Well, we are going to launch in. We are in our Power of Acts series all about the Holy Spirit. Today, we're talking about the power of the early church. Have you been enjoying this study? It's been incredible. Many of us are reading the devotional writ by, written by our pastor. Uh, it's called Unhindered, where we are reading Acts at home. So there's just this incredible moment where we're talking about what God was doing. And I want to tell you, God was doing something so amazing that we still talk about it today. Many of you know I've shared I was quite a bookworm as a kid. Uh, I didn't want to go outside and play. You know, my mom was having to hide my books because I loved to read. It was my most favorite thing to do. You know, no moderation there. So she was having to hide them just so I'd go out and play with the neighbor kids. But I loved reading because as I read, there was just incredible adventures that were not taking place on my street. We were having fun, but the adventures in these books were were just amazing, fantastical. And many times you and I, we can approach the book of Acts in that way. We're reading about how God was moving and we're going, wow, this is amazing. I don't know if anybody here has ever been guilty of saying, I wish we were like the book of Acts church, right? Many people have said that. We like to forget, however, this is one of the most persecuted times in Christian history, but God was moving. I wanna encourage you today, the power of God that moved in the book of Acts that we still talk about today is the same power that resides in his, his followers. You and I, when we say, Jesus, come in, Holy Spirit, come in, we have the same power that they had in that day. So we're going to look at them as a case study to talk about how is it that we tap into the power of the holy, I'm sorry, of the early church. So today we're going to be looking, if you brought your Bibles, you can open up, or if you have the app, open up to Acts 2, 42 through 46. We're just going to break this down. I'm going to read it all together at first, though. And it says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all as, I'm sorry, and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds as any had needed. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. Every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So what I'd like to do is there's so much richness here. I'd like to take and break it down to three main things that I think that the Lord is speaking to us today. And I think the very first thing that we can learn from the early church in Acts is that we have to commit the presence of God the presence of God. They devoted themselves to the teaching. They have devoted themselves to these times of gathering in the temple like we do every single week, breaking bread. That's kind of like small groups. So they were committed to being in large group and small group and doing life together. Everyone was filled with awe. I want to tell you the very first effect of realizing the presence of God is that we are filled with awe. You see, people in the Bible that came near to God, they were amazed. That's that feeling of awe. His glory fills us with awe, but I want to tell you something that's absolutely true. It also fills us with a sense of fear. If we truly consider who God is, how great He is, and we truly understand what it means to be humbled under the mighty hand of God, there's going to be a little bit of fear because you and I, we mess up. And going into the presence of an almighty God who is perfect, who has never sinned, can be a little bit frightening. He has all authority. But I want to tell you something. We get it wrong when we consider this idea of being humbled under the hand of God. You see, we begin to imagine in our human nature what authority looks like to us here on, in our world, in our hearts, 
And oftentimes we've seen, and hopefully we haven't been this person, we've seen people with a little bit of authority. Maybe it was a bad teacher, maybe a, a boss or supervisor who, you know, took their small amount of position and made other people look small, feel like nothing and insignificant. Maybe for you, you've seen parents or you've experienced parents who made you feel like you were less than because they had a small amount of authority. I wanna tell you that is not a picture of our God. That is not the awe, that is not the fear and trembling when we come into the presence of God. Here's what it looks like. I've come before the Lord with an open and an honest heart and say, God, I've messed up. I can't hold that back because that's pride. That's trying to pretend I am something that I'm not and I'm imperfect. I wanna tell you I have wrong desires, wrong thoughts every single day and it is incumbent upon each and every one of us that we would come before the Lord and say, Here, here's who I am. This is my flaws and here's the amazing part. God takes those flaws, the burdens that we're carrying, and he takes them off our shoulders. And then I'm in the presence of God, and when I walk out, I have more confidence than when I walked in. He lifts my head, Scripture says. He takes that from me, so being humbled gives me more confidence than when I try to come in and I try to walk with my pride and my authority. It's completely different. Being in the presence of God is a wondrous place to be. In his presence, there is full peace, full joy, full love like I've never experienced. It is a sweet place to be. Many times in our lives, we're trying to fill our lives with fun over here with friends. Going on this trip is going to finally bring me the peace I desire. It's going to pull me out of the depression. All the things that we're seeking to fill our lives with so that we're so busy that we cannot go into the presence of God, it's actually there. It's in His presence that I am made whole. So we must prioritize his presence. We must find ourselves there. It's simple. God does not make it difficult. If for you, you are already somebody who has a daily schedule and you are in God's presence, that's wonderful. But if you've never started, and the only time you experience the presence of God is when you show up on Sundays and you're singing praise to Him, it's not enough. It's time to daily be in the presence of God. Start small. Put it on your calendar. Wake up a little bit earlier. Go to bed a little bit later. Five minutes, ten minutes, where we consider God and who He is, all He's done in our lives. He shows up. He's faithful, and I get to just rest in Him. And it is He who is enough. And I walk out of those moments feeling I am enough through Him, not because of anything I did, but because God is the one who He's equipped me. I want to tell you something today. If you get nothing else, get this. Because everything else that we're talking about today flows from this. If you are not in the presence of God, you will not have the power of God. It will not work. It is how we are equipped. It is how we walk through our day. It is how I say the right things. It's not my own power. It is in God's power. But I must be in His presence. I love what it says in Psalm 1611. You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal are pleasures. We get a little taste of what it's going to be like in heaven for all eternity in these moments when we just focus on God. Just be with Him. Christians have been the most impactful in the world when they are filled with glory and praise for the King of Kings, when they are overcome by the presence of God. 
Being in his presence transforms us like nothing else can. When Moses was in God's presence, he looked different. I want to tell you, when you're in God's presence, you're going to look different. You're going to act different. People will notice something about you. The children of Israel, when God's presence was with them, they were invincible. If you read through the Old Testament, nothing could stand against them. But when they turned away from God, they were weak and easily destroyed. It is the same for you and I. Are you easily destroyed? Can somebody's comment send you into a tailspin? Suddenly you're in depression. You don't know what you're doing with your life. Everything's wrong. This situation, is it making your life seem like it's blown up? My recommendation to you is spend more time in the presence of God. Because in his presence, we are strong. We don't have to be on that journey any longer of tailspin. The scriptures tell us we are pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down, but we are not destroyed because we have the peace of God in our lives. We have a joy that cannot be snatched away by our circumstance. Prioritize the presence of God. We have freedom in Jesus. The reason Jesus came is so that we can be in relationship in the presence of God. Spend time daily. Right now, if that's the step that you need to take, you can go ahead and not listen to the rest we talk about. But if the step you need to take is you need to just schedule that, pull out your phone. You can just put it in your lap. Nobody will notice. Schedule that. Put an alarm. When the alarm goes off, God, I'm just going to focus on you. I'm going to start there. It will change everything. We also see in Acts verse 43, the power of God, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. So how does God show his power? Throughout the ages, he has shown his power through his people. You and I, we are a part of the body of Christ, which is not just gathered in this room. It is gathered across this valley. It is gathered across this continent. It is gathered all around the world. We are the body of Christ. We are united with one mission, and it is to follow Jesus and to tell others about him. We need God's power. Ephesians uh, 3, verses 21, or 20 through 21, I love what Paul says here. This is the end. If you have a chance to read the whole thing, I recommend you do. But this is the end of a prayer that he's praying over the Ephesians. And it says this here at the end. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations, forever and ever. Amen. When we're doubtful of the power of God, we began to think Paul was just a little bit wild, right? He was a little bit exuberant in his praise. He just was an excitable guy. Praise, you see, it tests us. It tests our faith. It tests what it is that we believe. Do we feel praise welling up in us the way that Paul did? He couldn't stay silent about how amazing his God was. We are a people that God has done so very much for. The very fact that he died on the cross for our sins to break the power of sin in our lives so that we can walk in freedom, and sometimes we forget it. If he only did that for you, that's the only thing he ever did, it would be enough. Do we praise him for his miraculous power? Do we praise him that he is daily transforming us? He is making us more and more like his son. We are holy because he is holy. I want to tell you, the Israelites, they often forgot what God had done, the miraculous wonders they saw, and they began to fill their mouth with fear. And they began to fill their mouth with complaining. 
And I want to just ask you today, as you think back over your, your week, was your mouth filled with fear and complaining, or was, was your mouth filled with words of praise? Because that's going to give you an indication of where your heart is and where your faith is at. Do we know God who is all powerful? Oftentimes, we in our minds, we limit what God can do. But I want to tell you something today. God is limitless. His power is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And with him, nothing is impossible. We must recognize the power of God so that we can avoid stumbling around in our unbelief. We need to look at what God has already done in our lives. We need to look at what he is doing in his church. The, I mean, God is moving so mightily right now. People are being drawn to the name of Jesus. They are not being drawn to a person. And I hear stories from other pastors about how God is just moving miraculously. God is incredible. And just like Paul, our hearts should be bursting with praise to him who deserves all glory and honor. I want to let you know, we sometimes get this idea in our mind that God has favorites. Yes, God is powerful. He just is not going to use ordinary people like me. I want to tell you today, there is no one more ordinary than I am. And it is okay, because God's power is made strong in our weakness. God did not pour out his power on a few select people. His Holy Spirit was not for the elite. It was for the common man, because that is how he has always reached a lost world, you and me. We are equipped with the power of God, and we've got to stop limiting the Lord with our own thoughts. He is powerful. He is good enough to give you the words that you need to speak. He is with you. He will lead you. He will guide you. Let's operate in that. Here is the moment that God will empower you. It is not just because you want his power. We see this in the New Testament with Simon the magician. He just wanted the power. He will empower you when you are in his presence. So start there. You will be equipped. You will begin to trust him in new ways and be spirit-led in ways you could never imagine. As we continue along in this pa uh, passage, we can see the importance of the people of God. In verse 46, it says, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple, and then they broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts. God is calling us to live our lives together in community. And for some of you, that's frightening. It's okay to come to church on Sundays, but we want to separate that from the rest of our lives. But we are called to be united as a body of believers. And we're not even just called to love the people that sit around us that we like the best. We're called to love the messy believers who don't seem to have everything together. And I want to tell you something. Spoiler alert, you're a messy Christian too. Some of us hide it a little bit better. Isn't that true? Maybe we're a little bit better. You don't know what's going on. But we're all messy Christians and we all need each other. We have experienced the inward transformation that comes in salvation, but we continue to be transformed. Our minds are like minds. We're united. We have the same mission. We are following Jesus. We are telling others about Jesus. We're finding our purpose in him. It's a new way of thinking, and we have to stop thinking about ourselves. It's a really hard thing to do because the first person I think about when I wake up in the morning is usually me. Am I hungry? Do I need some coffee? How am I doing? How do I sleep, right? But God is calling us to have the mind of Christ that thinks of others first, not to consider what's best for me, but to consider what's best for those that are around me, what is good for the brothers and sisters in Christ above what is good for me. We see relationships different as believers. We have a new way of understanding how to impact the world and those around us. The Bible calls us to submit to one another in love and in respect. 
A lot of us, we hate that word submit, don't we? Oftentimes, somebody's brandishing that word to tell you to do what you're told, right? Scripture tells us we are to submit to one another, constantly coming under humility. Ephesians 5.21 says, submitting to one another in fear of Christ. Here is a really important element. You have to look back at verse 18, where it says, be filled with the Spirit. It is connected because I want to tell you, it is impossible for you to submit to one another and think of others as higher than yourself on your own. It's not in your nature. You must first be filled with the Holy Spirit. We go back to that presence. I got to be in the presence of God if I'm going to do the hard things and I want to tell you it's hard. Submitting means that we give up our rights. It means that we're not thoughtless. We're not self-centered. We're not opinionated. That's hard for a lot of us. Me too. And we're not self-seeking. It means we seek the truth together. We realize our own sinfulness and we consider the good of the whole body. Here's the hard thing. Are you willing to give up your rights? Are you willing to listen and to learn from others? Are there people that you can learn from that are around you or is it you that has to be the one that gives the final word? We need to be in humility and here's the hardest one of all. Are you willing to suffer injustice for the good of others? Jesus showed us a perfect example of that. He was mocked, he was beaten, he was crucified for us. Are you willing to lay down your rights? To truly submit to one another, we have to be filled. When we're in his presence, we're changed and we look more and more like Jesus. He's our foundation. I see a beautiful picture of this. You, you can look with me as well in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. This is what it looks like. This is what we begin to look like as a body of believers when we submit and we are following the Holy Spirit and we allow him to change us. It says this, love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy, it is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable. It does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And when we are filled with the presence of the Lord, his love that knows no bounds, that knows no conditions, is how we are able to love one another. This is the test. Some of us need to write this down. Am I looking more like this and less like my old sinful self? Is this a description of who I am? Now, I don't want to mislead you. Just being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that you're going to have disagreements. Oftentimes we sharpen each other in disagreements. I think there's a beautiful example of this found in Galatians 2. I'm not going to read it, but let me tell you, Paul and Peter had a disagreement. You see, the Lord had told Peter that the Gentiles were accepted as clean. But Peter began to feel cultural pressure because he was raised as a Jew and there was racism that was happening. Jews were saying, we'll only accept the Gentiles if they do exactly what we've done. And Peter gave in to the pressure, even though he had already heard the Lord speak something different. So Paul calls him out. And he says, Peter, this is wrong. And Peter ends up admitting that it was wrong. I want to let you know Submitting to one another does not mean that we deny the truth. It means that we call each other to what God has called us to in Scripture. We do not compromise the truth of God's Word. But we do so with patience, with love, and with humility. And in our final verse, we see verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. Every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. 
I've said it before and I will say it again. The task of sharing the gospel is not for those who have a profession and ministry. We are each and every one of us called to go into the whole world and to make disciples, teaching them. That's not just pastors. That is all of us making an impact. But I want to caution you. For some of us, we do it out of obligation. It's become a requirement. We feel like we have to talk to others about Jesus. And what has happened is that fire that we first had when we invited the Lord in, we've allowed it to die in our lives because we have neglected the presence of God. And so we're going out as mechanical beings and saying, Jesus loves you. Turn to Jesus. But we don't mean it with our heart. And we're not being spirit-led. I want to tell you there's a lot of damage that this can do when it is an obligation, because I want to tell you there is nothing detached about how the early church told others about Jesus. They were on fire because he lit that fire in them through his Holy Spirit. Are you on fire today, church? We have the privilege to preach and teach to those around us not in a man mechanical way, but we need to be looking to and leaning on the Holy Spirit for the right words to say, not the words that said to that person before and it worked, so I'm just going to say the same thing. What is the new thing, Lord, that you would speak to me? Who is it that you are leading me to today? We cannot lose our passion. If you have, go back to the beginning. Spend time with God. That first love of Jesus. Let's focus on that and let him ignite the fire. The second thing we need to remember as we are telling others about God is that it has to be all about him and it cannot be about us. Paul is the best example of this. He was constantly trying to get out of the way of what God was doing. It wasn't about Paul, it was about the Lord. I wanna tell you, the Bible talks a lot about flesh. That's our human nature. That's our sinful desires. And what the flesh wants is to be on display. The flesh wants recognition. It wants the spotlight. It wants to be appreciated for what I have done. Then I will continue to do. But let me tell you, that is not in the Holy Spirit. That is in ourselves. It is about what he is doing. I want to tell you, we see a lot of examples of the wrong way to do it. We see it on social media, people looking for fame. We see it in the workplace, people looking for credit. We see it in our homes. Who's the greatest? There's competition. In the body of Christ, it must be different because he is the greatest. And I can walk in that confidence. Christians were filled with God's love. God's love is the opposite of the flesh. Love is not puffed up. It does not want to display itself. So to be a person who is operating in the spirit as we tell the good news, I cannot rely on myself. I can't rely on my charisma. I cannot rely on the things that I'm good at. I must be relying on the Holy Spirit. Scripture tells us He is the one who will give us the words. He will fill our mouths. But I have to be prioritizing that presence of God if I am going to be walking with Him and speaking what He tells me to speak. It's not about us getting credit. It is about all credit, all glory going to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I want to tell you, the reason people were attracted, the reason people are attracted to this place is not because the worship is the best worship in town. It's great. It's not because we have the best pastors in town. It is because there is a body of believers who are willing to get out of the way and say, Lord, it is you who draws people to you, so let them see you, not me. And we have to get out of the way something healthy will grow. Are you personally healthy? 
God cares about your spiritual life. He cares where you're at. He wants to transform you. Are you being changed? Are you the same as you were a month ago? Are you the same as you were a year ago? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to change you? We are called to be renewed. We are called to be transformed. Are you spending time with God? Do you know His words? He will change you. Are we seeing people added to the body of Christ because of you? Do people know that you're a believer, that you're different because you are spending time in the presence of God? Healthy things will grow. And maybe for you today, you've come in here and you have never invited the Lord to come into your life. You've never started that. You've been trying to do things all on your own. And I want to tell you, every single person in this room that has accepted Christ into our life, we've tried that too. And it doesn't work. We've all failed. We all mess up. We carry the, sh the sh shame of sin. But he doesn't want that for us. Are you ready to say, God, I'm done. It's you. And in this moment, I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. We're going to give you privacy. Maybe you know that that is you. You have come here today and you know something has to change. I want to tell you, it is Jesus that will make the difference. He died on the cross for you and for me so that we didn't have to be punished and so that we can enter the presence of God. And the Holy Spirit is faithful to call you. He knows you. He loves you. And in your seat right now, you say, I want to respond to that call. With no one looking around, would you just put your hand up? I just want to acknowledge you, and I want to pray with you. I see you back there in the back, on the side, yes, and in the far back, and right here in the front. I see you. Yes, I see you right here. I agree with you in the name of Jesus. I see you on the side. The Lord loves you. He's calling you. And over here on the side, I see both of you. Are there others? This is the most important decision you'll ever make. I see you on the side. Yes. In the middle. In the name of Jesus. He is calling us. I see you in the back. He has chosen you. He has invited you into his family. What an incredible truth. And would you just join with me in prayer? I want you to pray something similar to what I'm praying out loud in your heart. Would you just own it? This is what you're praying today. Father God, we confess that we have messed up. We have made mistakes. And that sin has separated us from you. But you had a plan and you sent your son so that we could be reconnected and in relationship with you. We're tired of doing it on our own. We give you our shame. We come before you with open hearts. Nothing is off limits. We give it over. Wash us clean. We're sorry for all the wrongs that we've done. And we turn to you now, Jesus. We enter your family. You are our God, no other. We stand before you. We follow you. And Jesus, we know that this life is hard, but you go before us. So God, I pray that you would help us on this new journey with you. We declare today there is going to be no turning back, but it is going to be all eyes on you going forward. Make us different. Lord, we glory in the power of your salvation. Only you could do it. So we thank you. Give us freedom. Lift our heads. We thank you so much for your goodness, Lord. Give us the courage to follow you and to tell others about what you have done in our hearts. Surround us with believers who would encourage us on this journey and who we too can encourage. 
We thank you in your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching this message uh, from the Highlands. Our goal here at the Highlands is to become people of the word. We love the word of God. And the message you just heard was filled with scriptures that we pray would be an encouragement to you. Make sure that you share if you were encouraged by this message with others to help us get God's word out. Uh, if you have not yet subscribed to our channel, I want to encourage you. We have messages and content every week that would encourage you and help you grow in your faith. And then make sure you uh, just like this video. And we want to continue to get the gospel out to as many people as we know how to, as we're able to. This is great technology. Thank you for joining us on YouTube. We pray that you're encouraged, pray that you have a great week and that you would live out what you just heard in your daily life.